Hello. Today I want to tell you about something quite extraordinary. It comes from psychological research. Now, the advantage of psychological research compared to normal educational research is that you can have a control group. And a control group gives you a lot of certainty about the accuracy of what you're finding. And we're going to look at two things. The first is going to be the effects of space learning. And the second is going to be the effects of interleaving. Now, both are connected. Uh, space learning involves the gaps between when students encounter learning that they've already met before. Uh, and an extraordinary thing, students need time to forget in order to make learning better. So this is a video that might challenge how you think of learning, certainly challenged me when I researched it. Okay, let's look at what the world of cognitive psychology and cognitive science tells us about what happens with memory. So here we have a graph which gives us the amount that's remembered and set that against the time um, that it's retained for or the time over which it's forgotten. Uh, the first thing I might notice is this 10 minutes figure here. Um, what does it mean? Well, students might learn 75% of the content that you're teaching them in a lesson, but if they review those notes um, 10 minutes later, it goes up to over 95%. Um, so they've increased their learning by around 20%. Now, obviously, this won't work in the normal school day because students move from one lesson to the other. So it strongly suggests that we shouldn't teach to the bell. Um, we need to get students to review their notes, to review their learning in the last 10 minutes. And often, plenaries will be verbal and will actually allow students to opt out of that review. Uh, so this might mean a change in your teaching away from um, verbal plenaries in some lessons where you're reviewing uh, learning in this way. Next, uh, I'd like to point out the steepness of this curve. Um, so after 24 hours, if we follow that up here, uh, students have forgotten nearly 50% of what they learnt, or rather they've retained only 50% of what they were taught. Um, and this is the curve referred to here, the forgetting curve. Now, what happens next is quite interesting. If they revise that same content after 24 hours, um, that forgetting curve slows down, so that then after a week, they've still retained around about 60% of, of what they learned. The graph is showing us that there isn't an advantage in studying the same learning every day. Uh, what this red line is telling us is that if we re review our learning every day, um, we might get higher, but then we'll still forget at a quite steep curve. And it's actually beneficial, and this is really counterintuitive, it's beneficial to have the gap between the day and the week. We don't want to keep revising the same content if we want to remember stuff in our long-term memory. And then similarly, if we have a gap from one day to a week and then one week to one month, then the rate at which we forget keeps dropping. So you see, the longer we keep spacing out the intervals between review, the less we forget. Now, this is very strange because there seems to be some sort of mechanism in the mind that wants us to forget, but then the neural pathways, when we learn something again, become much stronger so that we then forget more slowly. And this space between um, one day and then one week and then a month or a couple of weeks is crucial in improving learning. So the implications for your teaching are quite clear. Um, when you're moving on to new content a week later, or two weeks later, or a month later, you need to come back and test some of the original content that you taught then. Uh, not all of it, because obviously you want them to have new learning as well. But uh, let's imagine you were setting them a multiple choice set of questions on Show My Homework, um, 20 questions. Well, 15 of them might be on the new learning, but five would be on the old learning. And just the very act of having to rethink the old learning will increase the neural pathways and make it much more difficult 
for the student to forget. Um, so you should be constantly reviewing that learning. And now that we've moved to linear GCSE courses, uh, it may be that you're reviewing learning that happened at the end of year 9, beginning of year 10, and uh, it's not a wise move to do this only when there's a mock, but actually to do it on a monthly basis and constantly going back to one or two questions from earlier learning. So it's constantly being reviewed. Next we have a revision tool, if you like, using revision cards. Uh, so these boxes are imaginary, although they could be real for the student. You imagine them with a pack of revision cards based on their notes. And the idea is that um, they start with all the pile in box number one and revise them. Uh, so they test themselves or someone else tests them. If they get the answer right, that card goes into the next box. But if they get the answer wrong, that goes to the bottom of the pile and stays in this box. Now the next time they come back to revise, they start with the cards in number one. And if they get them right, they would go into box three. But if they get them wrong, they come back into box one. And then the student would go on onto the cards on box two and do the same. If they get them right, they'd go into box three. If they get them wrong, they'd go into box one. Then the next time students came to revise, they would start again at box one. And if they got them right, it would now go into box four. And this time the student will revise all the cards up to box 3. Those that were right go into box 4. Those that were wrong would go here. And so on. Another variation is that if you got them wrong, uh, sorry, if you got them right, they would only go to the next box. Um, however, um, the gap between learning might be important here. So if there are only days between testing, then you'd want to put cards that you got right further along so you don't meet them again too quickly. Remember, the effect of forgetting is important, so students need gaps in which to forget knowledge in order to remember it again more strongly. And I know that's counterintuitive, but as again, it has profound implications for how you get them to revise. Cognitive psychology also has a, um, information that will help us decide on this. Uh, how do we get students to learn? Do we in gradually increase the difficulty of tasks, which is, I think, how most of us teach? Or do we break tasks down so that they are easy? Many of us do that through scaffolding. Or do we have a more random mix between hard and easy tasks? And amazingly, it's not the logical ordering of one and three that has the most benefits. It's actually the ability to mix hard and easy tasks. Um, and that's something I think that instinctively we avoid in teaching, but actually has the highest results. Uh, so why not give it a go? And then finally, uh, there is a right answer to this question, which of these leads to better learning? And uh, instinctively, um, teachers, I think, opt for uh, version 3. Certainly students do when I ask them. But in fact, the um, psychological uh, cognitive tests tell us this. Once students have studied something once, the best way to relearn it is to be tested on it again because that forces them to re-establish those neural pathways through which memory is set and then to be retested and retested. You only really have to go back and study something anew if there's a massive gap in understanding. Um, but that would have to be a massive gap, because small gaps in understanding can quite easily be corrected uh, by the test itself and by the mark scheme. Uh, this doesn't sound a very exciting way of teaching, but the exciting part is this. All your lesson preparation goes into these lessons when you're studying. This doesn't require loads and loads of preparation, but it does require marking. Of course, what you've learnt in the video so far about the forgetting curve tells you that the interviews, the intervals between these tests need to get bigger and bigger. But the extraordinary finding is, testing is learning. Students can't help but learn when they're undergoing a test. 
And then a final tip for revision cards that really surprised me. Imagine you had your keyword on one side of the revision card and then the details on the other side. Well, if you put them in um, an anagrammatic form, so here we have chlorophyll, I'm sure you've spotted that already, as an anagram, the mental agility needed to decode it um, primes the brain for learning so that when they... Uh, when the student flips over the revision card and reads the other content, they learn it better than if it had just been labelled with chlorophyll. A nice, neat, easy trick that takes uh, very little effort and pays dividends. Why not try it? If you would like uh, further information on um, the psychology and the cognitive uh, um, science behind this video, then uh, you need to get hold of uh, Bjork's work. Um, it's on the UCLA website, but very easy to find. Um, keywords, the Learning and Forgetting Lab will get you there on Google. And uh, good luck in improving the memory and learning of your students. If you found the video useful, please like it. It gets more views that way and other people will benefit. And if you didn't like it, then obviously don't. Uh, and uh, please provide any comments. I reply to them every week. Thank you very much.